Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our programming today is sponsored by Awake Us Now. Today, Pastor is teaching from his series, The Living One. Many today are misled by assertions like, Jesus probably never really existed, or there's no evidence for Jesus outside the Bible. Atheists tend to concede Jesus was a real person, but they argue he didn't claim to be God or that the resurrection was staged. If you are questioning whether Jesus really did live, or if you want to be equipped to answer questions like these, then we invite you to join us today for Pastor Chris Dodge's teaching from The Living One. Good morning, and God bless you on this Palm Sunday. Welcome to Awake Us Now. Today we're going to continue in a series of messages entitled The Living One. And the title of today's message may sound strange at first, But I think it's going to make a lot of sense as we move forward this morning. The title, They Were Clueless. Let's begin with prayer. Well, Lord our God, we thank you for your incredible revelation. Your revelation of yourself, of your amazing love and holiness, your incredible forgiveness, your Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit who leads us to faith and empowers us to live the Christian life. How can we ever thank you enough? We praise your glorious name and we pray that you are honored in our worship today and that we are changed by your word of power and truth. Amen. Well, today is Palm Sunday and around the world, Followers of Jesus are celebrating that great event as Jesus announced himself in the very city of Jerusalem, the city of David, announced that he is Israel's Messiah. Palm Sunday brings all sorts of images and memories to mind. We think of Jesus, for instance, on a donkey. The crowds gathered around him, palm branches waving. And people shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Those are the sights and the sounds of Palm Sunday. But to truly understand Palm Sunday, it's essential for us to see what led up to it. And so today we're going to do something a little bit different on this Palm Sunday. We're not only going to look at what happened that day, but what brought that day about. And what we are going to do is we're going to turn back the clock. Taking a look at the Gospels, one of the things that becomes very apparent as we read Matthew, Mark, and Luke is that Jesus repeatedly predicted that he would be crucified and rise on the third day. In fact, in those three Gospels, on three separate occasions, he says that to his disciples. This is what we read, for instance, In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant, and were afraid to ask him about it. Or, to put it in the vernacular, they were clueless. Jesus repeatedly told his disciples what lay ahead. He gave them clear warning. He made it very clear that he would fulfill everything the scriptures had said about him. But still, they were clueless even when he said those things. And the cluelessness didn't stop there. As we continue to read in the Gospels, we find that weeks before Palm Sunday, we don't know the exact timetable, but a matter of weeks before, Jesus had been summoned back to the area around Jerusalem because a dear friend, Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, had died in the town of Bethany. Jesus went four days later. Lazarus had been in the tomb all that time. By Jewish standards, he was definitely dead. And Jesus came, and he spoke words of great healing and power. He spoke to Martha and said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will not die, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And Martha said, Lord, I believe you're the Messiah. And then Jesus, 
after talking to Martha's sister Mary, goes to the tomb of Lazarus. And we read these words as John records them in John 11, verses 43 and 44. Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. And at that point, just two miles from the city of Jerusalem, you would have thought that people would say, wow, this is the Messiah. And many of them did. But we're told that many others went back to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and the Sadducees and said, you won't believe what this guy has done. They were clueless. And they led to some of the most clueless words ever spoken. But words that are also ironic. You see, the high priest in that monumental year was a man by the name of Caiaphas. Joseph Caiaphas was his full name. He was a Sadducee, incredibly wealthy. And when he heard what Jesus had done, this was his response. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. By the way, Caiaphas didn't mince words. It's interesting. The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that the Sadducees were incredibly rude people. And, and they would just say whatever they thought, irrespective of the consequences. You know nothing at all how to win friends and influence people. Or to put it in the vernacular, you guys are clueless. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And Caiaphas, the priest, the high priest, is concerned not about truth, but about preserving one's position. And at this point, we are told the entire council from that day on, they plotted to take Jesus' life. John mentions something very interesting. He says that when Cephas spoke those words, he didn't realize it, but he was actually prophesying because he was high priest that year. He was prophesying the death of Jesus, not just for the Jewish people, but for the world. And now the plot is hatched in full. Jesus had been hounded by the religious leadership for many, many months, but now it takes on an even more vicious form. By the way, in the Talmud, the, uh, the writings and collections of the traditions of the rabbis, early in the Talmud, from the period basically around 70 AD into the mid-100s, we have this description from the rabbis of what happened next. This is what we read. This is known as Sanhedrin 43a. They wrote, on the eve of the Passover, Yeshu was hanged. For 40 days before the execution took place, a herald went forth and cried, he's going forth to be stoned because he has practiced sorcery and enticed Israel to apostasy. In other words, he's been performing miracles and he's calling people to worship the one true God. <laughs> And then they said, anyone who can say anything in his favor, let him come forward and plead on his behalf. But since nothing was brought forward in his favor, he was hanged on the eve of Passover. Hanged on Passover evening. That's exactly what did happen. By the way, there's something rather interesting here if you look at it closely. This section begins by saying on the eve of Passover, Yeshu was hanged. It's a word that is often used, even in the New Testament, for crucifixion. It ends by saying he was hanged on the eve of Passover. But the charges against him were that he be stoned, the traditional Jewish way of execution. As we know from the Gospels, what happened is laws had changed, and as a result, they couldn't stone him. He had to be crucified by Roman authorities. It's rather interesting that even in writings of the opposition, we see many of the truths of the New Testament 
clearly set forth and declared. Well, at this point, Jesus moves. In these last few weeks before Passover, we are told that our Lord Jesus moved, and this is what we read in John 11, verse 54. Therefore, Jesus no longer moved about publicly among the people of Judea. Instead, he withdrew to a region near the wilderness, to a village called Ephraim, or Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Ephraim, or Ephraim, was located about 13 miles north and east of Jerusalem, in the wilder- near the wilderness area. And there Jesus basically retreats until he knows the time has arrived. The enemy has put a contract out on him. But Jesus will go, go to the cross, willingly, but in his time. You see, they didn't have a clue. Just as Caiaphas said it's better for one man to die than the whole people perish, he didn't have a clue that he was actually speaking the truth. (laughs) That he would die, the Lord Jesus would die for the sins of the people. None of them understood. Only Jesus. From the very word, go, he had told his disciples, here's what's going to happen. I will be handed over to evil men. I will be killed. I will rise on the third day. Pretty straightforward. But the opposition never understood. And I might add, neither did his followers. Well, we're told that just days before the final events of the week that we know as Holy Week, pilgrim crowds gathered in the city of Jerusalem. They came from all over Galilee, Judea, all over the basically the Roman world. And huge crowds gathered in Jerusalem, usually about a week ahead of time, for purification. And this is what they said. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, John 11, verse 55 and following, many went up from the country to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, What do you think? Isn't he coming to the festival at all? They were clueless. But Jesus was in control. And so we read, as the crowds had gathered in the temple, wondering and waiting and thinking, Well, will he come or will he not? Jesus set forth. And with his disciples, he headed to Jerusalem. We are told that one day before the day we know as Palm Sunday, Jesus had showed up in Bethany, where he had raised Lazarus from the dead weeks earlier. A very, very great meal was served. And on that day, in the evening, Jesus and his disciples were there with Lazarus, and Mary and Martha. And then, out of the blue, Mary took a jar of precious nard, an extremely costly perfume, broke it open, and poured it all over Jesus. We're told in the Gospel of John, chapter 12, that the smell of that perfume filled the entire house. And I might add, Jesus was sweet-smelling at this point. But Judas, one of the twelve, was incensed. And this is what he said. It could have been sold and given to the poor. But Judas was a thief and he wasn't concerned about the poor. But Jesus responded. John 12, verses 7 and 8. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Mary understood, at least in part. Jesus understood in full. Judas was clueless. And so the next day, Jesus, with the smell of costly perfume still upon him, heads to the city of Jerusalem on the day we know as Palm Sunday. And on that day, 
riding on a donkey. Jesus goes into the city, but along the road from the Mount of Olives and down into the Kidron Valley and up to the temple, we are told the next day, John chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, the next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It must have been an amazing sight to behold. The Messiah comes riding into town at a very time when people were saying, will he or won't he come? He suddenly shows up even though there is a contract put out on him. And he comes riding on a donkey. Not on a war horse, but on a donkey as had been predicted by the prophet Zechariah. When kings came to a city, if they came on a war horse, they were came, coming to conquer and destroy it. If they came on a donkey, they were coming in peace. And Jesus, the Prince of Peace, comes to the city. And the crowds are ecstatic. John tells us that those who had seen his resurrection of Lazarus and had witnessed all that went on, they came down the Mount of Olives. And another crowd came out of the city of Jerusalem and down into the Kidron Valley. And they began shouting and waving palm branches, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, which means, Lord, save us. And that's what he came to do. But they still were clueless. They recognized he was the Messiah, but no one caught on what that really meant. Jesus, however, is the only one in the entire account who is not clueless. Because John tells us that shortly after all this transpired, a group of Greeks came up to one of Jesus' disciples and asked, could we have an audience with Jesus? And then Jesus spoke these words. His disciples still didn't understand. We're told in John chapter 12 that at first his disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. But then, at the behest of Greeks, Gentiles, Jesus responds, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, or literally translated, Amen, Amen. Amen, by the way, is an acrostic in Hebrew. It means God is a faithful king. Amen, Amen, I tell you. Unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And even here, in the midst of jubilation from the crowd, in the midst of people shouting and waving palm branches, which basically served as the national flag of Israel, Jesus knows full well what lies ahead. Caiaphas was clueless. The crowd was clueless. The disciples were clueless. But Jesus knew. The way of the Messiah leads to the cross. And that, dear friends, is the measure of the love of God. Jesus comes in humility before the Father. Jesus knows what lies ahead. The events of what we call Holy Week did not catch him off guard. He knew full well and had known all along, this is where it ends, and this is where it begins. But the path to our salvation meant the death of the Messiah. And what the rabbis had only speculated about, now is shown by Jesus to be reality. You see, the rabbis had wrestled with the fact that on the one hand, the Bible seems to depict the Messiah as this glorious and conquering king. 
On the other hand, it seems to depict the Messiah as one who suffers. And they couldn't bring those two pieces together. They usually chose to go with the glorious Messiah. But they missed the point. The point that the prophets had said all along. The point that the prophet Isaiah had made very clear. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb that before its shears is silent, he did not open his mouth. He went in humility. He went in obedience to the Father. And he did that because the living God loves you and me. Because there was no other way. Sin and rebellion against a holy God must be paid for. And either we will pay for it, or God himself will. And as a result, we are told in the scriptures, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word became flesh and gave his life for us. And in him, there is forgiveness and life today. That is why the New Testament scriptures, that is why the Lord Jesus, that is why the Holy Spirit cries out to people today, repent and believe the good news. Repent, recognize our sin and rebellion against God and believe the good news that God so loved the world he gave his one and only son. Palm Sunday is not simply about celebration. Palm Sunday is about the love of God who willingly went to the cross for us. It's about the Messiah, whom, as the Apostle Paul tells us, God made to be sin for us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He paid for our sins. He paid for it in full. And he offers us life and forgiveness. Today we celebrate but today we also reflect on the cost, the cost to the Son of God, the price that he paid, and the powerful proclamation that in him there is life and forgiveness. My prayer is that each of us repent and believe the good news. Amen. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Lord our God, we praise your holy name and thank you for the mighty things that you have done. On this day, we say, Hosanna, Lord, save us. And we humble ourselves before you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the nations, our Lord and our Savior. And we resolve, we repent. And we believe the good news. Amen. Let's discuss Palm Sunday, shall we? And just a few things to get that discussion going. First of all, as you reflect on the events leading up to Palm Sunday, what especially stands out for you? What is the thing or the things that especially speak into your life and your heart? And secondly, have you ever been clueless? I'll just tell you right up front, all of us have been. There's only one who is never clueless. And that is the living God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are many things that happen to us in our lives and we wonder why. But God, who knows all things, knows that he will ultimately take all things and use them together for good to those who love him. And finally, how does the clear resolve of Jesus speak into your life. How does his obedience to the Father's will minister in your heart? I'd encourage you to continue to ponder these things. I'd also invite you to check us out at Awake. If you haven't done that or if you haven't done that recently, everything on our website is free and we certainly invite you to make use of those materials I pray there'll be a blessing for you. Thanks so much for listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Today's program was sponsored by Awake Us Now. 
We encourage you to learn more about God at our website, awakeusnow.com. And please come back and join us again next time.